In 1936, the Oneonta Star newspaper established a photo engraving department. They also gave Bob Wire a camera, and his life would be forever changed. Robert Selden Wire was born on August 15, 1908, in Plainfield, New Jersey. He was the son of Arthur Charles Wire and Louise Selden Wire. While Bob was still a young child, the Wire family moved to the Catskill Mountains, where they purchased a home in Delhi, New York, Delaware County. After graduating high school, Bob moved to New York City, where he studied commercial art, attending evening classes at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. During the day, he worked for advertising agencies. Two years of study and work later, Bob realized advertising was not for him, and he returned to the Catskills, where he began work as a writer for his father, then odor editor of the Delaware Express newspaper. He soon started writing for several more newspapers as their Delaware County correspondent. It was then that Bob received the camera that forever changed the path of his life. So Wire's photography is really a remarkable record of uh, the history of Delaware County and the Catskills over 40 years uh, during the, you know, the mid 20th century and it really exists nowhere else. The Bob Wire negative collection is so integral to telling the history of Delaware County. It is a literal gold mine for us. It's a priceless artifact to have is his whole collection. Anytime someone comes in looking for a picture of an individual or a house or an event, one of our first places to look is the Bob Wire collection. We think, do we have a wire negative we can look at? Back in around 2006, I was uh, visiting a gentleman named Ed Davidson. Ed grew up in Bovina, had been in World War II, had been a POW, and he reminded me that about a year after he got out of the POW camp, he was hired by Bob Wire to fly an airplane to do aerial pictures around Delaware County. And he specifically was doing most of his flying around Bovina. And so I'm like, oh, I think the Delaware County Historical Association has the negatives. So I contacted them a couple months later, fall of 2006, I came in, brought in my scanner, one of the first scanners I had that could do negatives, and proceeded to scan some of those aerials. And I've had to rescan them all because <laughs> I didn't quite know what I was doing, but, but they turned out okay. And so I was one of the first people to come in with a scanner and use the collection. And then they started having other people come in. And then when I started working here in 2011, and I started looking at the collection, I was like, wow, this collection is incredible. And we need to utilize it. And, you know, 
now we can because technology is allowing us to to scan these images. Uh, when they got the collection back in 1979, uh, the only way, you know, you could look at a negative and go, well, okay, well, we gotta go to a photo lab to print it out. And sometimes you didn't know until you printed out that the picture wasn't as good as you would like. You know, sometimes it was a little blurry or something. And that's the nice thing with the scanning now. You can rule that out right away if the picture ends up not being a very good picture. And so um, I was just, I. So I was excited. It was one of the collections I got most excited about when I first came here to work was the Wire collection. And we started, you know, exploring all kinds of things with it. Someone had give me an old scanner, about a decade old, but it could do any size negative you want. It took forever. It would sit there humming and humming and you'd go and do some chores. But that's how we started scanning. We've since upgraded to a more modern scanner. Um, but that was kind of my introduction to the collection. And I was just always impressed. One of the things I like having on record is the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Wire are the ones who gave the negatives. When they retired, they're the ones that made the decision to donate. They gave the copyright over. Um, they did not include the postcard collection, but everything else they donated. And I thought that was rather forward thinking of them to do that. Because uh, within a couple of years, they were gone. And then DCHA got a couple of grants to do some work on the collection. Some of the negatives were nitrate, which uh, can be a fire hazard. And, uh, and so did some work on the collection. And, uh, but other than that, until the advent of scanners, it wasn't getting a lot of use. Uh, the other thing that is really lucky about this collection is the fact that, and I'm sure this was Mrs. Wire who did this, there is a 10 drawer card index to the negatives. Because I know people have gotten negative collections and they have no idea who, who it is. Well, we do. And uh, so that was an incredible thing to have. And then we had a really wonderful volunteer who spent nine months typing every single card into a database. And now we can search by all kinds of parameters. And we've made all kinds of wonderful discoveries out of the wire database. So um, I, I sometimes think, um, we have a volunteer here who sometimes thinks that I, I focus too much on that collection. And there are great collections at the Delaware County Historical Association, but this is one of the largest collections we have. And it's the one that draws people. When we did an exhibit of the photographs, we extended the exhibit because people kept coming to it. In the dead of winter, people were coming in the door to see the wire photographs. And it's just something popular because people still remember Mr. Wire. A uh, number of them have been photographed, but they also just like seeing, you know, what Delhi looked like in the 50s and, and uh, you know, just what the place looked like in general. So I think it's a really fun collection and, and uh, we have a lot, of, I think we have a lot of fun with it. I'm Elvina Teeter and I worked for Bob and Billy Wire for 12 years. 1965 to 1977. Bob and Billy were wonderful to work for. They were like, they were like a family. You, I had an ideal job because it was my second job from out of college, and uh, I stayed home with my children. So when my youngest went to school in 1965, that's when I started working for them. She had an ad in the paper, and. I didn't have, if the children were ill, I didn't have to go in. I just call her up and say, I can't come in today or whatever the reason. Went to school vacations, I didn't have to go. So it was really perfect, perfect for me. And then in the summer, I didn't work. She always hired a high school girl. Every fall, they went to the city, New York City, for what they called a buying trip because for their work trip, he had to have film and different whatever he needed for his cameras. And they took me with them one year. They did all out. They went all out. We went, um, we stayed at hotel, the Hotel Piccadilly. And we went to Sardi's for dinner. It was really a plush, plush place. And I didn't drink. And so she made me have uh, tomato juice. And she said, probably they'll charge you for vodka. <laughs> and uh, and then we and then we went to we see a show showbert showboat was playing, and we had seats right down in front. I mean, Bob did. It was you know he was just being 
trying to make a real nice, we had a wonderful weekend. Uh, we received the Bob Wire archive, the, the uh, 150,000 plus images uh, in 1979, just at the time that Bob and Billy Wire were retiring from their uh, photogra photographic um, profession. Um, and we didn't really use the archive too uh, too much over the over the last thirty years. It wasn't until we got a scanner, you know, a flatbed scanner, uh, that we were able to uh, scan the negatives and turn them into positives. So uh, from from the historical association's point of view, the last seven or eight years, we've really been um, you know obviously beginning to use some of those uh, images much more frequently. Uh, and for us, it's been kind of a game changer, really, for the museum. Um, we we often get um, uh, requests from various people, groups and organizations and individuals for photographs of various uh, periods of time in the, in the mid 20th century, uh, various themes, various people. And it's really one of our first go to places is the Bob Wire archive. Um, so it's been huge. It's been uh, you know, an enormous influence on DCHA. Uh, we we did our first exhibit of Bob Wire images maybe five or six years ago, um, and they were immediately popular. Um, I mean, again, I guess that the archive continues to surprise us. Um, again, over 150,000 negatives. We've only scanned a few thousand of those negatives, so it's an ongoing uh, process, really, to, to keep scanning these things. Uh, and I think the exhibit, uh, surprised uh, folks who came to see it because of the you know the breadth of the subjects that he that he captured uh, some of the more sensational photos some of the people who uh, came to the exhibit recognized their family members or their friends uh, Bob Wire um, began his career in the late 1930s uh, I think the first photos that we have are 1938 and his career spans 40 years to about 1978. Um, I would say that he's, uh, his, his images are particularly uh, interesting in the late 1930s and the 40s and the 50s in the sense that he took images of the lurid, you know, the sensational crime scenes and so on and so forth, uh, fires. Uh, and along the way, he also took pictures that, dare I say it, uh, more mundane uh, in the sense that, you know, he worked for insurance agencies and newspapers. Um, so he took pictures of barns and farms and buildings and uh, for those for those reasons. Um, of course, over the, the span of time, the last 70 or 80 years, they've just become really interesting. I mean, like I said, they were maybe mundane when he took them, uh, but they're really interesting as historic documents because they're now 60, 70 you know, almost 80 years old. Uh, and I would even put the, um, the photos that he took of graduating, graduating seniors and younger kids in, uh, in schools around the area. I would put that kind of in that category too, in the sense that in and of themselves, they're, you know, mundane really in a way, but they've, because of the passage of time, they're now really, really good historic documents. First, I'll let you clue you in where I was in Bob Wire's life and I, he was in mine. Okay, I lived on Delaware Avenue as a young boy and uh, Bob Wire uh, lived on Delaware Avenue also and Billy was there with it and I'm sure that <clears throat> we were very good neighbors and uh, Billy and Bob, they were friends of my father's at that time and I think that you have a photograph of my sister and I and Billy taking the turkey out of the oven on one of the calendars that they produced here. But Bob, he was a hard fellow as a young boy to put a, a handle on, would we say that? He was always off working. And uh, later on, when Billy uh, helped him, she was, uh, I would like to call her almost the spark plug of the, of the two. If you went up and had your school picture taken, they'd got you all lined up out in front of the school and everything. And here, when I graduated, there was about 80 into our graduation class. And now she wanted them to, to liven up and smile a little bit. And she would get out in front and do her thing. She would, first it would be cheese and that'd be bologna and what's wrong with you and so on and so forth. And the kids, of course, she would have them all smiling by the time. She'd step out of the way and Bob had the picture. 
And so that was her job seemed to be. And I almost feel that when they went on the road taking postcard pictures, that Billy also was the person in the office doing, getting ready for the orders, making all that out and everything for them. That wasn't Bob's deal. He turned that entirely over to her. And when you go up to the office, Billy was the one you wanted to see. Bob took pictures, Billy did the rest. So, and I have this picture here of stopping in his office and quickly saying, Bob, I need a picture. And there I am with a very nice deer. He ran right out and snapped the picture. I don't know whether they have it or not, but anyway, whether he saved that one or just took it. So, uh, at one time, I believe my memory is right, that we had a photographic club at school and we would meet at Bob's place and Mr. DeGellicke, who was the uh, school principal, he was also a photographer and uh, we would get, they give us all the hints on how to take a better picture and do all that and so on and so forth and we would go out and for the week we would get our pictures and uh, use up our roll of film back then that wasn't too hard and come in and then we would go into the dark room and so on and so forth and uh, develop them and uh, Bob was always very good at showing us all how it worked and everything else so he he was also uh, outgoing that way with young people and uh, with Mr. DeGellicke and he helped out that and that was, <clears throat> that was just a, a service that he did for the community. We had a lot of people that did service for the community that never got recognized for it. Very interesting fellow. His factory shots are really interesting. It's, um, it documented uh, the workers. The light was beautiful. And it showed the environment of which they were. Yeah, he's very talented. He um, he caught the moments uh, for like the milk guy uh, pouring milk into a sack. Whether it was posed or not, it showed him doing something. And there's validity to his pictures in that. Uh, same with the, uh, the spool girl. Um, even though she's not doing anything, it gives a great, whenever you get a picture of a person within the environment, it gives scale. If you didn't have a person in that picture of either one of them, you wouldn't know how big the sacks were, how many spools there were. So it gives it scalability. It brings it down to human size so people can relate to it. Main Street was the heart of many, many towns in this country. And Main Street has changed dramatically. Either uh, populations have moved, industries have moved out, it affects Main Street. And you can tell an awful lot of character driving down a town about their Main Street. What kind of businesses are there? Uh, especially around a post office. It's the heart of a community. So you have to have an eye. And I don't think everybody has an eye. You have to have an inborn talent and ability to see things. I saw an awful lot change uh, in my career. Not as not as much as Bob did. I mean, he would go out with a speed graphic or some sort of camera, old style film or plates. Uh, even uh, speed graphics had um, sheet film. He'd shoot it. He didn't have a clue what he had until he got into the dark room. He had an inkling. Um, he was that experienced, but he had to go into the dark room, soup it, dry it, and print it. And that all took considerable amount of time compared to a second for these for phones. Working as a journalist, everyday journalist was a blast. Every day changed. And I'm sure it changed for Bob. You wake up in the morning, you never knew what you were coming you were going into. You could be hit with a car accident or a fire. Then you go do a feature picture, you do a portrait, and then you end your day on a sports assignment. Um, it was so much fun. It was so varied. As I say, every day was different. You weren't stuck in an office and you got to meet people. Journalists have to have an innate 
sense of curiosity about them. You have to figure out what makes people tick to make them comfortable in front of a camera. It's pretty intimidating to have a big old lens pointed at you and having um, sound of a shutter clicking and all this sort of, sort of stuff. You have to make them comfortable so you can get that inner picture. Eyes of the soul. Um, you have to be able to peer into that and see what makes them tick. Um, and that's where you get your good pictures. I think every photographer should do a self-portrait from time to time. It's, it's really good discipline to turn the tables, to make it, to have you feel what it's like to have a camera in your face. The senior portraits were really interesting. His lighting was consistent, you know, traditional three-point lighting, I believe, uh, hair light, side light, background light, everything. But that's what you do. That's what happens in a studio. You have it all set up. You get the person in, sit them down, get a couple pictures, boom, next person. So if that was his bread and butter, it seemed like he did a pretty good job at it. Well, when I was younger, my father had a pharmacy in Delhi called Lee's Pharmacy. And upstairs in one of the apartments lived the Bob Wire family. Bob and his wife, Billy, and there were two sons, Bobby and Peter. And the reason I remember the little boys best at that age when they were preschool was I was a soda jerk for my father at the soda fountain in the pharmacy. And Bobby and Peter would come downstairs and climb up on the stools at this very famous, not famous, but this very fancy uh, soda fountain, the kind they used to have with a mirror behind and, and ask for Cokes. They would buy them, I think. But that's how we first got acquainted with the, with the children. And we knew Bob and Billy because they were the photographer. He was a photographer for our wedding, which had been in 1955. Bob would set up his camera, of course, and this was in the church. Billy, his wife, would arrange our gowns, the bridesmaids' gowns, my gown, and uh, set the scene, so to speak and then the phot photograph would be taken. And it's a very complete uh, account of our, our wedding and reception and leaving on the honeymoon with the cans tied behind the Dodge. And so that's our recollection of how Bob and Billy worked and did so many weddings in our area. But he was well known to everyone in the community. In 1933, Bob married Wilhelmina Sebesta. Everyone called her Billy. Billy added an important component to the wire photographic operation with her business skill and personality. It was said that Billy would coax a smile from the Sphinx. It was also said that she had a talent of ferreting out the false and phony. We have a lot of negatives. There are over 150,000 that were donated to the Historical Association. They are indexed, which is very helpful because there are so many of them. And one of my jobs is to scan them and make them digital so anybody who asks for them, can we can send them the pictures. And we've been able to publish them in books and other publications. Having them digital is a real, is a real help for that. And what I usually do is people or whatever the topic is we're looking for, well, I'll look it up, I'll try to go into the vault, it's where it's stored, look up the number and pull the negative, and I'll scan the negative and it'll come up um, as a positive on the computer. And it gets, it lets you see a much clearer image of what the negative is. I have probably scanned 500 or more photographs, and that's a pretty conservative estimate. Ray and I have attempted various times to scan the first 1,000 negatives, but it's so difficult to just scan and keep going like a machine because the images are so interesting and you get distracted and you want to go off and research them and find new stories and before you know it, you've spent the whole day researching one set of images and you really aren't that much closer to scanning the first thousand. It's such, a, it's such an easy rabbit hole to get pulled down looking at the negatives because you pull out a negative, you'll find an interesting description, it says, barn fire and you pull it out and you look and there's a picture of a barn just completely engulfed in flames and there's individuals milling around and you think 
okay, we know the date, we can look it up in the newspaper. And then you're looking in the newspaper and you see in that all the details about it. Were they able to get the animals out? Were they able to save any of the equipment? How much was the loss? And then you see the family and then you flip over in the newspaper and you see them rebuilding. So it's just such a great storytelling process. There's a lot of interesting stories that are revealed going through the wire negatives. One, the first one that I can think of is from 1944. There's a photograph of a young man lying on the ground in a garage and it turns out that this was a photograph taken of a man's, of a dead body. The young man's name was Private Burr Townsend. He committed suicide in Andes. He locked himself in a garage, turned the car on, and asphyxiated himself. And his body wasn't found until about a week later. And Bob Wire, he worked as a, for crime photographs. He has the picture of Private Townsend. And it's really sad to see. Um, one of the ideas of why Private Townsend killed himself was because he knew he was about to be sent overseas in World War II and he was so stressed out by the possibility that he committed suicide. Uh, and we'll never really know exactly what Private Townsend was thinking, but it's, it's a very striking image and I think it really speaks to the rawness of Wire's images and how he could capture scenes. I was looking for someone's negative one day. I was looking for Roy Scrimshaw because he's on our board and he knew Mr. Wire and I knew his senior picture was in there and I go through and I come to this index card that says Aubrey Scrum, naked pick for evidence. I'm like, what the heck is this? Uh, so, so I start digging, I get the picture out, scan it. Oh my God, the guy is standing there naked. What for evidence, evidence of what? Well, fortunately, as well as indexing these photographs, they're all dated. So we got to the local paper and very quickly we found that Mr. Scrum was involved in a rather sensational crime out of Masonville in 1940 when this farmhand killed this family, the husband, wife, and daughter, and burned their house down. Uh, Scrum was not involved with the murder. He was kind of an accomplice after the fact. But we started going through and for about two days, that's, <laughs> we just kept going after that. We found the pictures of the gentleman. His name was um, uh, Mr. Fink. And he, um, he had he killed the family. And after he had been arrested, Mr. Wire photographed like the arraignment, near as we can tell. They, they, he basically they tried to escape to Pennsylvania. They didn't get very far. They were caught within about 24 hours. And so they were arraigned. Um, he had some amazing pictures of, um, of uh, the two men just eating sandwiches, drinking coffee. And you're going, like, you know, this guy just murdered three people. <laughs> and look at this picture. And there are also pictures of them taking him to the crime scene, to the burnout foundation of the house. And, um, and as it ended up, we, you know, we kept kind of digging into it. And uh, Mr. Fink was sentenced to 70 years at Attica. And uh, in the 1960s, uh, he tried to get the sentence reduced because of pretrial publicity, because there was a lot of pretrial publicity. The papers had stuff about it all over the place. And it, it, his suit failed. It didn't work. But he was in Attica during the riots. And he saved the life of a prison guard. So he ultimately was paroled and he actually ended up going back to where he was from. He lived in a sheltered workshop. He had diminished capacity at the time he did the crime. He, um, the story went that he had had a pencil jammed into his head when he was about nine. And so they said he, his, his IQ level was not of an adult. So, but uh, we went through, I mean, <laughs> we, we finally had to get back to doing our regular job, but it was just fascinating. So. We started doing more digging in the negatives, and I'm not quite sure how we came across the Luscombe murder. This is the gentleman who killed his wife, his estranged wife, went to her parents' house and basically killed her. And we're not sure how Wire was there while well, the dead body was still there. They just arrested the guy, and we don't know if he was there for the press or the police or what. But Bob Wire was there. There's this incredible picture of Mr. Luscombe. He's got blood on him because he half-heartedly tried to slash his wrist after he killed his wife. His head's in his hands and his wife's dead body's on the 
itself on the back. And that picture went viral in 1943. It was in the New York Daily News. It was just all over the place. So, um, and so that held, so there were all these pictures of that. And Mr. Luscombe ended up, they were going to sentence him to death. And they finally got it changed to life in prison. And he got out in about 15 years on a technicality. And when he passed away, as near as I can tell, he was buried next to the wife he murdered. But one of the things that was kind of amazing about this story is we had, we, we put up the picture. We really had to include that picture. And we actually warned people that there's going to be a couple pictures in this exhibit that might be a little bit unsettling. But it's a picture that Bob Wire talked about late in life as one of the two most memorable pictures he ever took. So um, we didn't put the name on there. But this gentleman came in one day and he says, I, can I see the Luscom murder? I go, okay, so how do you know about that? And he goes, well, the victim was my aunt. So we actually brought him into the research room and got the other pictures out. And he looked at them and he says, oh yeah, I recognize that piece of furniture. That was my grandmother's house. And he told us the whole story about what happened because his grandparents for the rest of their lives, almost every time they visited, told the story. It was just something that impacted them for the rest of their lives. And basically the husband came in, he was going to, he was going to shoot the wife and then he was going to kill his mother-in-law. So his mother-in-law ran upstairs and jumped out a window and broke her leg, but didn't get shot. But as soon as he killed his wife, all the anger just went out of him. His father-in-law just said, all of a sudden you could just tell, you just drop the gun. Just all that anger just immediately went out of him. And then that's when he tried to kill himself. But it was fascinating. We spent a couple hours with this guy talking about, you know, the murder of this family member. So... Um, you know, we think of how bucolic and lovely and quiet Delaware County is. And in the 1940s, there were several rather sensational murders that took place. There's the senior portraits. I had my senior portrait taken by uh, Mr. Wire, as well as my passport picture. Um, Mr. Wire also used to take the, um, the grade school portraits, and we don't have the negatives of those. He did that for a company. But... Always, when you had your picture taken, you're there. Mrs. Wire is the one. She gives you the comb. You comb your hair. You, you know, do everything to make yourself look presentable. And I think when I was in ninth or 10th grade, I think it was ninth grade, um, I missed the scheduled time my class was supposed to go. And I must have said something to somebody. I said, well, go during lunch. So I went in during lunch, and it was just Bob there. Billy wasn't... Billy was having lunch or something. He says, yeah, I'll take your picture. And he sat me down and he goes, say pumpernickel. And I go, hello. And he snaps the picture and that's the picture. <laughs> it's the, out to posterity today because you only took one shot. So I always kind of say that as an argument to that's why you needed Mrs. Wire because she knew how to make you look very good. And that's a thing I think I sort of knew, but in terms of going through the collection, you know, we have to remember the incredibly important role that she played in the whole thing, because I think she's the one that kept the card file up. She's the one that came up with the Bob Wire postcard business, which ended up making a lot more money for him than, you know, doing weddings and things like that. He stopped doing weddings after about 1960, because they were a lot of work, and the postcard business was more fun. They're going all around the country and things like that, so... It does allow us, at least for this area around central Delaware County, we've got a really good visual picture of life in that time period. Uh, we're incredibly lucky to have this collection. So I think that, you know, that's part of the impact there. And we have sometimes, we just did an exhibit about uh, um, firefighting apparatus. And so we got talking about, well, let's look at what kind of pictures Bob Wire had about fire. Fire, fire and Wire, which was Samantha's idea. I don't want to be taking credit for it. Fire and Wire or Wire and Fire? Which one? It was Fire and Wire. Uh, but anyway, um, so we have those pictures out. And the day of the event, two of the trucks that we photographed were brought to the event. We've got a gentleman who's interested in just about any old trucks. And you have to get a little creative on trying to pull up pictures of trucks. But... We're finding some, and he's just having a ball over those. So, um, so I think you know, I, I don't, I don't think the Bob Wire collection is is really you know taking over the wheel and driving the organization. But um, 
it certainly has had an impact. It is one of the things that brings people in. It's not the only thing, but it is one of the things people will come in sometimes because they do want a picture. Um, uh, we've, a couple of times we've had pictures that they wanted their wedding pictures because their wedding pictures disappeared some way or another. And if Bob Wire took the picture, <laughs> we have it. I will tell you one of the frustrating things is very occasionally we find we don't have a negative. Uh, and it seems in every instance, this was the case when the collection came because it was inventoried when it was donated. Uh, the famous painting of the courthouse in Delhi, 1951, I think. Um, Wire photographed the artist painting in the courthouse square. And you can see the picture in the newspaper. We don't have the negative. And I was like, oh, I really wanted that. And when it's gone like that, sometimes we don't know why. We don't know why it's missing. He, he photographed some amazingly, you know, scary stuff and some really neat stuff. And, you know, um, the fire pictures that we went through, we found a couple of pretty emotional looking pictures. There's a picture of people sitting on their lawn. One woman, she's hugging her dog. You know, another one's just hugging because their house is burning up in front of them, you know. And uh, so sometimes the pictures he gets, there's some amazing emotion in there and not sure if that's what he was striving for or not. His skill, definitely, he, he was learning a lot. His early pictures, some of them are kind of you're like, mm, you know, you're really wondering what's going on. So there's a change in how he photographed. And then just in terms of, if you're looking at a lot of the school stuff, you'll see Halloween kids, you'll see people in blackface. It's an incredible picture of a minstrel show over in, probably in Bloomville, that um, someone had alerted us to and we found that it was a Bob Wire picture. So there's just some of that you see in terms of, you know, life and things going on. Um, but, you know, he was photographing basically from 38 to 78. So, and in the 60s, he wasn't doing so much of the local photography. But when he was doing it, even if you just look at the senior pictures, you look at how the, the men took longer to change. Basically, it was the jacket and tie, jacket and tie, jacket and tie. Um, the women, you can kind of watch with the hairdos. You know, the hairdos get taller and then shorter, you know, and stuff like that. And so there's some really interesting changes that you can see there with, the, um, with those kind of pictures. Um, but I think, you know, if you even look at like, you know, here's some baby pictures. He didn't do a lot of those after the 60s. So we mostly have the 40s and 50s to look at there. Um, he did a lot of people in uniform. Again, that was mostly World War II. Um, and because in 1960 is kind of a key break is when he starts going into the postcard business and he's not doing weddings anymore. He's still doing senior pictures. He's doing some of the yearbook um, pictures and things like that. Um, He's no longer doing, he did a lot of um, the liquor license. If someone wanted a liquor license, you'd have to go in and photograph the bar and hotel. Now we've got these great pictures of these local bars and hotels. It's a really wonderful you know, thing to have. But again, after about 1960, that pretty much stopped. I do know he, he was very generous. Uh, Andy's school is a very small school. And Pettis Kaufman was a teacher there. And Pettis would take black and white pictures for the yearbook for Andy's school. And he would bring the film to Mr. Wire. And he would develop the film, make black and white glossy pictures for the Andy's yearbook. And he was never, never asked for any money. He just did it for out of his heart. He was very generous. The nicest picture that I saw that related to us was my husband's great-grandfather, George Pometier, and two other men, I can't remember their names, at a baseball game. And there was a, there was a big picture of that, and I think there was a newspaper article when I saw the, the picture. And then he, Bob got that negative out and did a print, glossy print for me. Believe it or not, I, it was hard for me to believe, but they're washed in water. 
So the big tank went around, this big tank went around with the pitchers in it, washed them. And then when they were washed, as I remember it, there was something like a drum that you put the pitchers on. Each pitcher put on the drum and the drum went around and dried them. So that's why when they're out, you have to flat put them in the press because they're curled a little bit. So I learned quite a bit about I used to spray them when he was gone if we had to have an order of, of something we could have made that he didn't wasn't there to make then they had to be sprayed then Billy bought a camera in, in the later years and she took some pictures and had postcard postcards made with her name on them Bob was kind of in the background very intelligent, but Billy was the one, she, well she was intelligent too, but she was the one that really spiced things up like Halloween time, the kids would come to their house and she had, she'd take coins, nickels and maybe even a quarter, put them under apples and then they, she'd, you know, like the, what, the thing with the pea, uh, which one has the pea underneath and she'd stir them around, you know, and they'd choose one. Or she'd pick them up and they'd see the money, you know, underneath it. And then she'd stir them around and they'd choose which apple they wanted. And they got the money that was under the apple. <laughs> of course, kids that wanted candy didn't go there. <laughs> Bob was always a gentleman. Billy would, would, Billy was the one that could talk to the person that they were going to take a picture of. She kind of set the stage, you might say. She would fix the brides and their gowns and help them dress and just write. And she, she would say um, different things to them to get a, a response for them to laugh or, or smile or something. And then he would get a good picture. So it was funny to watch them work together. Bob always drove a big Buick and Billy drove a little white Volkswagen and she would sit way down in the seat and all you see was her big, she wore big rim glasses and you see these big rim glasses. And one day Bob had to go somewhere and his car was in the shop and Billy offered him her car and he said that driving a Volkswagen was like driving a roller skate. Billy told me once when I first started working, she said, how did she put that? When Bob gets angry or frustrated, he kicks the wastebasket. <laughs> I never heard him kick the wastebasket. <laughs> These agricultural things are really interesting. Um, but this is more candid type of stuff, although it's interesting though. The old, He's way ahead of his time here. Um, the old tilted horizon that everybody was doing back in the 70s. Let's make the picture interesting and tilt the horizon. He was doing it in the 40s, <laughs> 38. It's all really interesting slice of life type of things, the agricultural deal. And um, this milk strike is, is, is really quite interesting. The, the farmers who are participating in it didn't really seem to mind him around. Strike nowadays, um, you can get some pretty angry crowds out there um, protesting and they will take their anger out on the media. Maybe they were thinking um, if they show this, it would help their cause. Um, but what a waste. Uh, it's just even in modern day milk strikes that happen to drive the price up because of um, too much supply is just, it's just a damn shame of all the star starving people in the world to throw away this food. The ice thing is really cool. I've always been interested in ice harvests and uh, the old ice houses. It's fascinating. The Everett Green race to, oh, it's a baseball team. Um, God, talk about a Amer slice of Americana.
Everybody likes having their picture taken. Most of the time. But photographers have a way of becoming part of the community. Um, and I think a mutual respect goes both ways in, in that. Um, I treated all my subjects with um, res respect and dignity. Um, this, there's one picture in here um, of the guy holding the trout. What a fun picture. I mean, even today, people are sitting there with their, you know, either their antlers or their whatever. And here he is, very straightforward guy with a nice trout. But it doesn't say what kind. But it looks like a nice fish. <laughs> it's nice to see uh, the politicians represented in here. But then, of course, then you have your um, group shots. <laughs> it's so typical group shot pictures. But there are the little kids and... 4-H festivals and Girl Scouts and who knows. And parades. Everybody's got to shoot a parade. If you're a journalist, you've got to shoot a parade. But it's great. Um, it's a real um, slice of life through, through his eyes. Uh, from dog obedience schools to farmers, wedding portraits. It's a it's a really extensive work for sure. This this murder is is quite remarkable. Interesting and fires. You always have to have a fire in here. That's the bread and butter of journalists. It is sadly the the crime and news of of the day. Yeah, nice deer, nice little white tail. But um, really interesting character. Um, and it shows in his work. The change in landscape that's gone on in Delaware County, you can see that through the, the photographs of, you know, nature and things like that, that the forests are coming back and things. That's been more dramatic since Wire's time, but it was noticeable. And then also, uh, in terms of just sometimes certain structures that are gone. Um, because he's actually documented at the corner of uh, Kingston and Maine in Delhi was uh, it was the YMCA. Well, that building came down to put in a Victory supermarket. Now that building's gone. They tore that down and the lovely mansion next to it to put in what is now Tractor Supply, but it was actually a great American. Um, so sometimes you see that kind of change in the landscape. You see as the school develop, they um, you know the school looks a little different now. Um, wire photographed it as it was being built. I'm talking about the school in Delhi. Wire in the 1940s and 50s offered a service to, for people to get their chauffeur licenses, which they needed to drive certain size vehicles, trucks. So chauffeur is not, you know, you know like, like Jeeves and Wooster type chauffeur. It's for driving large vehicles. And so um, he would often not only do the picture, but actually help with the paperwork for a while. So we have a whole group of pictures from starting probably in the mid 40s and going into the mid 50s of chauffeur licenses. And these pictures are kind of amazing because Mrs. Wire wasn't involved. The guy came in, sat down, snapped the picture. He always snapped them back then full length, but they only used this much of the picture to actually put on the license. And so they come in and sometimes they're in their ratty street clothes. They've just been, you know, shoveling dirt or something worse. Um, and so sometimes they come in. Now, some of them have come in. I just um, saw one of a gentleman. He's, he's actually very nicely dressed. And some of them will come in very nicely dressed for a picture that was really only supposed to be a headshot. But Wire always photographed the whole person. And what's kind of amazing though, is like, this is them. They're not really being posed or anything like that. And I would love to do almost like a whole wall of just those. And he was doing pictures like that into the 60s and 70s. Um, he started doing more focusing on just the head and shoulders. He was doing passport pictures. So he did a lot of those in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. As I noted, um, he did my passport picture in 73. And uh, so he was doing those. And those weren't quite the full length. 
um, for whatever reason, he started focusing more on what was needed for the actual passport. But those ones from the 40s and 50s, I, I love the fact that you see what they're wearing, right down to their footwear. Um, you see the backdrop. The backdrop is very simple. Um, there was at least one gentleman with a cigar in his hand. Uh, and actually, the same gentleman had a cigar one time, and I think he had a pipe another time. So you could see, and he, it wasn't in his mouth. He had to have it away from his face, but he had to look a little bit. But there was a guy sitting there, and there was a cigar still in his hand. So there's something that's very human about those pictures. It's predominantly men. There are some women, but it is predominantly men in, in that set. The passport picture is much more a mix of uh, male and female. But the chauffeur license was predominantly men, but there are some women and some of them maybe were driving trucks, but sometimes they needed it for some other form of ID for some other kind of job or something. Uh, the industrial pictures such as the, the, um, the, the powdered milk one, which is one of our favorites, uh, I think they were done in different situations for somewhat different reasons. I think the one with the powdered milk was all related to a large um, uh, creamery operation. And I think they wanted the pictures done to document that they're just beautiful pictures. Uh, sometimes the pictures, when particularly, because the one with the powdered milk, there's, a whole, there's about 20 or 30 pictures of that particular operation. Um, and I think um, for some of the smaller industrial ones, Sometimes it was done just for, might be for inspection purposes or something like that. Um, we found, uh, just recently came across several for gas stations. Though we think that maybe it was being done for the particular um, gas company, Golf. Uh, there were some great pictures of the inside of a gas station in deposit. We're really lucky that he took these. And I, but I think from situation to situation, the reasons sometimes varied in terms of why he did it. Um, he wasn't someone just generally going out and casually taking pictures. He was getting paid to take most of these, if not all of these. And uh, so it, it was just various reasons. And sometimes we don't know. And sometimes if we did know, I think we'd understand the picture a little bit better. And we do have some situations like that. Like with the Luska murder, we don't really know why he was there. Was he just being a journalist? Or was he there for the police? We don't know why he was on the spot so soon after that. He did um, a flood in Bovina in 1953. And it was obvious that he went there while the waters were still pretty high. It was a flash flood, so it was fairly localized. But someone called him or something because he hightailed it there. And there's a couple of shots with the water still running pretty high. It just went right through the hamlet of Bovina Center, knocked a house right off its foundation. And uh, then he came back the next day and took pictures of the aftermath. But he took a few pictures during the flood. And uh, I, I, I don't know why he took those pictures. When Bob started his career uh, as a photographer, it was a newspaper that started him. The Oneonta Star wanted him uh, to, they said, here, here's a camera. Would you go out and start taking pictures of the inquiring photographer or something like that? And Wire had said, he's like, well, okay, I don't know much about cameras. Well, he fell in love with it. He was taking pictures for uh, the Delaware Republican, and his father was editor of the Delaware Express, which merged with the Delaware Republican. But we'll find, particularly in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, you'll find photographs in the Delaware Republican that say photo by Bob Wire. Um, but like the Luska murder picture, didn't show up in the Delhi paper. As I said, that picture showed up in the Daily News, the New York Daily News. By the time Wire did the, the murder picture, particularly the Luska murder, he's working pretty much as a freelance photographer. He's not, he, he wasn't working for the, the Daily Star very long because once he realized he loved photography, I think he left them and started his own business. He and his wife started the, the, the business. And so I think he was a freelance photographer uh, he was involved, there was a the Delhi Photo Club, he was involved with that. Um, he was a member of some national organizations. He won some statewide and national awards for his photography. Um, and so, he, he, I don't know what kind of press connections he had beyond the local press. He may have had some, um, you know, connections that went far and wide. It still hasn't helped me answer the question as to why he was there right after that murder. 
I, still to me kind of intrigues me. And uh, I'm not sure we'll totally figure that one out. My father had deer in captivity a short distance out of Delhi on the uh, on Route 28. So when I was 16, it, I think it was my cousin and I had uh, removed ourselves from school one day to go deer hunting. Happened to be home for, sw swung by the house for something to eat, if you will. And Bob Wire shows up and he says, and, and Bob had a, a deep, I don't know if anyone has shared this, he had a deep, quite a deep voice. So he comes up to me, he says, he says Gary, he says, uh, I was just down to the Delhi Diner and, and your father said I could come up and take some pictures of the deer and I'd like you to be in the pictures if that's okay with you. Sure, it's okay with me. So from there, he took several shots and positions, directed me here, and took a picture and in someplace else in the field and I kneeled down and looked like I was hunting and he would take a picture and so on. And the one that went on the postcard, um, he'd asked me if I could get one of the deer closer to me. And he says, well, don't you pretend you're asleep under that tree and see if you can, one of those deer will come up to you. Well, deer like tobacco, they'll eat tobacco like a kid will eat candy. And about that time, uh, as a young fellow, like many back then, uh, we, we did some smoking. I happened to have, it was either a Lucky Strike or a Camel cigarette that I pulled out of the pack, baited the deer, whose name was Hoss, over my shoulder. So the deer came, looked over my shoulder, about ready to sniff or expect me to feed him the cigarette. And that's, and so the deer is looking over my shoulder and Bob Wire takes a picture of that, of that happening. So we get all done and uh, Bob says, this is the best part of the whole thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he says, <laughs> Gary, um, in, in order for me to make a postcard out of this, which I plan to do, he says, uh, I need your signature authorizing me to do so, he says, I'll pay you a dollar. And I'm thinking to myself, hot damn, this man gonna pay me a dollar for my signature? And he just honored me by taking my picture. That's four gallons of gas. I couldn't, where do I sign? Give me a pen. I couldn't sign fast enough. That was in 1957. They're still selling those postcards around the, uh, around the countryside, people over the years, people have told me they've seen them out of state. I heard more than one retailer tell me it was the best selling postcard they ever, ever put, put on a shelf. So he, Bob Wire was a much, much better business person than I was, I can tell you that. I could have gotten $2 out of that. And <laughs> I settled for one, it was good, that's great. I, I can picture Bob. Bob always, he, his his attire, he, he he ran true to form whenever and wherever you saw him. He, he always seemed to wear a dark, loose fitting clothing, if you will, kind of just so he could move around easily. Um, and I'm not sure that that was in keeping with the Style. He, he, he might have been a style setter. In fact, if enough time goes by, everybody's you know, whatever they wear will come back in vogue somehow, some way. Um, but he had, he had a, and I thought a pretty neat way of uh, his attire. I thought was was pretty neat for the time. It seemed very befitting his profession, especially as I think through this. Yeah, this Bob looks doggone. He looks like a photographer. She, as I recall, Billy, uh, and they were a great couple. I, I thought they were pretty, uh, they, they were, but most unique, you know. I said, I, that, 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 was, that was great, I thought. She looked different persona, uh, of course, than, uh, than her husband. Um, she might, 
I suspect she was more of the, the, the uh, manager type. That's what I'm thinking as I look back. I think that would I'd do pretty well on a test if that was one of the options. If I marked that, yes, that would have been, that would have been uh, Billy. Yeah. Yeah. She was a very sp spirited woman. Yes. See, this is where Billy, the business person, comes in. As I recall, when they did come out, she she gave me a fistful of them. So I I was hand, I was hand, I was handing I was handing off, promoting myself in 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 Hoss the deer for a long time with all those cards she gave me. Yeah, yeah. Another interesting story behind a set of wire photographs is a photograph from February 27th, 1946, which depicts a series of rifles with swastikas on them. And the only label in the index was stolen guns. And doing some research, I was able to figure out some of the background to it. And it turns out that it was taken in Fleischmann's and a World War II veteran sent home the guns to as a souvenir for his family. And the postmaster stole them. And that's why they were they were taken as crime scene evidence, and the postmaster was actually convicted of a number of different crimes of petty petty robberies and sort of tampering with the mail. And he was actively seeking out World War II souvenirs to pilfer for his collection. The postmaster who stole the World War II souvenirs was convicted of robbery again. The Binghamton Press listed had an article about Benjamin Reed being burst in by the police. They came in, they saw him lounging in a chair, eating bonbons and watching TV with a nice rug on the floor. The only thing wrong with the picture was that almost everything in it was stolen. So he had a, a quite the history of thievery. Benjamin Reed was also convicted of stealing cuts of meat from a local grocery store, and Reed was believed to have died in Attica Penitentiary. So I guess his the pictures Bob Wire took of his early crimes in 1946 began to document Reed's life of crime. A lot of people that I that I meet working at the Historical Association remember Bob Wire. They he's an integral part of their childhood or their early young adulthood. They remember either he took a picture of their wedding, he took their senior portrait, he was at a certain event that they saw him taking pictures. Um, I think he's just was always there in a lot of people's lives. He's a sort of a background figure that preserved a lot of history that ordinarily would not have been recorded. Another great aspect of the Wire collection is the fact that Bob Wire would take his camera into places inside and get great interior shots of filling stations, stores, and it's such a rare treat to see inside of these buildings how they were at the time when, when Bob was photographing. So Robert Selden Wire, known as Bob, means his nickname is Bob Wire. And a lot of times when I mention that, people say, why do you have over 150,000 images of barbed wire? And my response will be Bob Wire. So a lot of times it's a very confusing name. People who knew him swear that he pronounced it Wire, although other people who knew him also swear that he pronounced it Weir. So we all pronounce it as a historical association, we pronounce it Wire. And most of the people who knew him say it was wire. So that's the term we, we usually stick with is wire. It's very possible that he enjoyed having such a fun nickname, Bob Wire, and kept it that way. Bob Wire took two different sets of milk strike pictures. There was a strike in 39, and those pictures were mostly taken of um, car convoys being guarded, uh, there were people trying to stop uh, trucks coming out of a creamery, I think over in Bloomville. Um, they're dramatic in some ways because you see some of the tension with the people. There's a couple of really striking people. It looks like they're yelling at each other or something. And then in 1940, the pictures he took are of the actual dumping of milk. And those are the ones that really stand out because you see these waterfalls of milk coming out of the trucks. And um, so he photographed those and it was like a year later. He photographed one in Bovina, which startled the heck out of me when I saw it. And um, but there was there were a couple where I mean, there was just a waterfall of milk coming out of this truck. So and I don't think he was I think he was just doing that as a journalist. Um, and some of them did some of those like, yeah, they did show up in the, in the local papers, uh, which has helped us pinpoint a little bit more 
what the thing was about. So um, he he didn't do a lot of like events like that, but he did some. We uh, he did a few famous people. He did uh, Eleanor Roosevelt a couple of times. Uh, Eleanor spoke at the. Uh, International Assembly of Women in South Courtright at the McLean Estate in 1946. And he had a number of pictures of her speaking to the gathering. And he also just took pictures at the gathering. Mrs. Roosevelt was only there for a couple hours, but it looks like he went a couple of different days and photographed different people speaking, different seminars, things like that. And then Eleanor came back in the 1950s to speak to the Andes Forum. So that was probably one of the most famous people he did. The store is a store in Cannonsville, which is one of the drowned towns. And that's one of the interesting things that we've been trying to pull out of the wire collection are pictures of the towns that are gone. That picture is a woman named, I think her name is Mrs. Jefferson, Nora Jefferson. She was a cook at one of the camps, I think the Lake Delaware Boys Camp. As to why he took that picture, again, because it was fairly early in his career, I think that might have just been a human interest picture. And it's a striking picture. She's fishing. The cat is there. Um, it's a really neat picture. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I love that picture a lot. But I don't know why he took that other than, because I don't remember that one showing up in a newspaper. I, I, I don't know. We've looked real hard on it. We know the date of it. But it's just a very striking picture. And, uh, you know, and this is 1940s in Delaware County. There aren't a lot of African-Americans, you know. And uh, so it, it's kind of, you know, it's a surprise when you see a picture like that early on. It's a very fun picture. She's fishing and her cat is there waiting for the fish. And there's a great picture of this very large man being fitted for pants. And... The, the name in the index card just had a name, and there's three people in the picture. So we're like, well, who is who? We don't understand. I showed the picture at a program I did on the wire photos, and someone later on said, well, that name, that's the tailor. Because we thought maybe it was the gentleman being fitted, and it ended up that she recognized it as, well, no, he was a tailor. I did bookkeeping for both businesses, and when they were... Um, they went for on work trips every winter. So in the fall, <clears throat> we would be busy. What we would do is send a, a package of um, photo, photographs of different campuses and tell them the prices and stuff. And would they like to have them come photograph their campus? And when we got a lot of responses, then they would plan where they were going in the United States for their work trip. And they'd be gone all winter. I would, I would be in the office. I didn't take pictures, but I did take photographs for chauffeurs. So that hey, Bob had the cameras set up, two cameras set up. So when I took a, a chauffeur's picture, it took the two pictures that they required. And he had a little uh, machine that you stamped them out so they were round for the sir for that. But I was in contact with them. If something I really had to know something, I could call a bookstore ahead of where I thought they would be from the last time, and then they would call me. And they sent the colored transparencies to the office, and I would go to the post office for them, for their mail, and get those and order them for Dexter Press. And then when the post, lots of times, most of the post offices came were already printed before they came back. So it was my job when the photo, when the postcards came from Dexter Press, it was my job to open them and make sure they weren't off register or something was might be bad with them. And then I would pack them and build a college, send them, build a college. Billy told me that if I ever had a doubt about doing something, if I should send something or if a quality of a postcard wasn't right if i had a doubt in my mind of what i should do i shouldn't i would go ahead and not do it and i would never be reprimanded they would go to lunch billy always liked to go to deli diner because they always had breakfast so she would have for lunch she would have breakfast 
and I don't know what he had, but he would always have his get his New York Times. He was a good friend of John R. Clark. Uh, I believe he owned the Walton Reporter, and they would they would talk newspaper back together and. They would laugh about things that were written because it had two meanings, you know, could have a funny meaning or maybe a bad one, I don't know. I never, I was too naive to catch on to what they were laughing about, but it was funny to hear them. Oh, he used to tell about this, I think. The man that shot his wife, and he had to take a picture and the, the man was all blood. I can't remember. Oh, it was Luscombe. It was a big murder trial. Oh, there it is. Uh, several months before Bob died, uh, he called me and asked me if I would come up to the house and straighten out his, straighten out his checkbook and pay his bills. They were quite a mess, he told me. So I told him, yes, I would, which I did. And then it was just shortly after that when he passed away. Billy died on December 21st, 1981, at the age of 73. Six months later, Bob died on July 2nd, 1982, at home in his favorite chair, he was 73 years old. We've got a really good visual picture of life in that time period. Uh, we're incredibly lucky to have this collection. Really interesting character. Um, and it shows in his work. Bob was always a gentleman. Bob Wire, Catskills photographer.